let it keep going. Well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're joining us. Those of you online, so glad that you're joining us from wherever you are, whenever you are. Uh, we have a, a just an awesome uh, opportunity to worship together and the freedoms that we get to do this. And um, hey, if you've been coming to Hope Summit for a couple of the last couple of years, you've probably known that we've done an outdoor service, um, usually in August. So we want to invite you to our outdoor service that we're doing on August 13th, and we have a potluck right after. So you can bring your bring your chairs, your 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 friendly pets, and and we come and just have some uh, worship on on the lawn out there, and uh, have a service at just at 10:30, just one service. Um, and uh, it's just an awesome time for us to just chill and worship and, and be out in the, on the environment. We're, playing, we're praying for good weather. We've always had really good weather every time we've done this. Um, so, you know, keep in mind we're praying for that, um, as well as uh, just a fellowship with the potluck afterwards. So look up for more information, but it's August 13th at 1030. It's just that one service. Um, we also, uh, every month, we try to do these things called missions moments, and uh, usually... There's one, maybe two, uh, the month, but this month it's uh, Cooks and Hills at a, it's a, a camp in um, southern Kansas and Oklahoma area uh, that that specializes in bringing in uh, individuals that that need some extra uh, TLC and uh, kind of like uh, if you ever refer if you ever know what Boys Town is in Omaha, it's kind of like that, um, but it's just a a place for for kids to go that need a little bit more encouragement and they get to. To hear about uh, Jesus and, and and things like that, so we got a video we want you to take a listen to, take a watch to, and uh, go ahead look at the screen. Hello, Hope Summit Church. This is Pat Hubbard with Cooks and Hills. Just want to take a, a minute here to thank you guys so much for choosing us as your mission of the month for July. We are definitely honored and, and very thankful and grateful for all that you guys do for us. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to. Uh, Dale Myers and uh, Gary and Thomas and Charles uh, who all came out and served here at Cooks and Hills with us in June uh, to help with, help us with some work projects so uh, that's that's something that, that we always look forward to and I know that uh, Dale and and Lee comes out a lot of times and a lot of other guys so we just appreciate um, your enthusiasm and your passion for Cooks and Hills and for our mission uh, to provide a home school and therapy for kids who are at risk. So I just want to give you a little update on what's going on here at Cooks and Hills. It's been a busy summertime for us. Um, we got out of school right at, uh, at the beginning of June, and we have a real short summer, so we're only out of, out of school uh, for about a month and a half. So we go back to school, we'll start school back on July 19th, but we try to pack those summers full of, of fun stuff for the kids. So the, the families uh, take the kids on family vacations, summer vacations. So that's something cool that the kids get to go experience when you figure that a lot of the kids that come here have, have never been a part of a family and, and definitely never had an opportunity to go take a, a, a vacation somewhere. So that's a, a treat that the kids get to do. Um, summer camp, we send our kids to, to summer camp each year. So we send our kids to New Life Ranch, which is about 15 miles from us here but a, a wonderful Christian summer camp that we have ties to. And um, again, something else that um, the kids that, that, that come here that we serve that have usually never had a chance to go uh, take part in a summer camp. And so just some wonderful things that, uh, thanks to the support of, of people like yourself, generous hearts that you are um, giving to us to be able to um, provide these things for the kids to take part in. So we thank you and appreciate that so much. Again, we're starting school on July 19th, so keep us in your prayers there as the as the, the teachers get ready to, to start school and and uh, and the families get ready to uh, get these kids back into their regular routine uh, of going back to school. So so keep our, our staff and our kids all in prayer as as we uh, get back into school. Um, have a, a praise to to relate to you guys. We we were able to hire a set of house parents recently. So uh, the Kittles have, have come to us and just started last week. And so we are, are so thankful and, and blessed to have them come and join us, which that makes six sets of house parents that we have now. So that's definitely a big praise. Uh, but on the other side of that, we also want to ask you for prayers uh, that God will continue to send people here to serve at Cooks and Hills. 
Um, so while we are so grateful that we've got six sets of house parents, we actually have 12 houses up on top of the hill. So we've got six houses that are still sitting empty. So we know that, that God has the right people uh, in mind for us at the right time uh, and in his time. So just pray that, that he will send them soon because I know that right now we do have kids that are, are sitting on a waiting list right now that we can't serve because um, we don't have house parents um, to fill up those houses. So if you guys know anybody, if God puts something on your heart, hey, maybe I think so-and-so would be, be a good fit for a house parent position. Or maybe God's speaking to your heart right now and, uh, and thinking, man, that's something that I could do. I have a heart for kids. Maybe you've fostered kids and you feel like that's just not enough, that you would like to take it just a little bit further and, uh, and be full-time parents to, uh, to kids that are in need. So uh, if, if that God does touch your heart in that way, please uh, reach out to us. Go to our website at cooksandhills.org, and uh, you can contact us through there, or you can give me a call uh, at our number on our website as well. So thanks again, Hope Summit. We love you guys. We appreciate you so much. Uh, my wife and Carrie and I were blessed that we got to come out last October and, and visit and meet you guys in person. Uh, we had a wonderful time, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get back there again as well. So God bless you guys, and, and thanks again for uh, supporting us at Cooks and Hills. When you uh, give to Hope Summit, you give to uh, missions like Cooks and Hills and, and a bunch of other ones that are um, far away and then just some that are just across the down the street, uh, you can see a list of all of our um, all of our missions on the website, hopesummitchurch.com. You can um, do that. And uh, this is just an opportunity for us to just share with you how you can maybe get involved. You can pray. You can, um, if you're interested in, in going on some trips that we have, um, you can always talk to Dale Meyer. You can talk to myself. Or um, We usually know when they're happening. Sometimes I don't, and they do, but... Um, if you are curious at how to get involved in, in, in missions and, and serving um, these missions that we support, uh, you can always uh, ask us and, and, and do that. But right now, I just want to, um, I just want to pray for, for Crooks and Hills and also just pray for us this morning um, as we um, jump into worship time. Would you uh, stand and join me in prayer? Um, Heavenly Father, we just uh, want to just pray a blessing, special blessing over um, Cooks and Hills, and uh, the fact that um, they are bringing in um, people that need uh, some specialized care, that they get to hear the gospel in a um, safe place. Lord, I just pray that you keep um, Satan at bay, you keep um, the evil one away from the place that um, um, is, is is proclaiming your name, and, um, and any uh, fears and, and uh, evil can just um, um, have no place there. Uh, God, we just pray uh, for them to receive individuals who want to uh, go and help mentor uh, kids and students in, in, in Cooks and Hills. And then we pray that you send people, um, that you send them um, and you send them out to the harvest field, Lord. Uh, we also pray for the time that we have this morning that we get to um, connect with you and worship and uh, um, find this peace that we can only in you, Lord. And we pray all this in your name. We pray this in, it. in your name. Amen. We get to sing and worship this morning, church, so let's go ahead and do that. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Yes. All souls are torn by the blood of the Lamb. I'm not a slave to one. Tell me, damn, how beautiful that cleansing flood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Let's sing this out, church. Oh, precious is the flow that 
that makes me white as snow Oh no other fount I know I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love Shackled me, how infinite that grace divine. I am free, I am free, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Hey, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. There's power in the blood of Jesus How priceless, how precious There's power in the blood of Jesus How priceless, how precious again sing oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow oh, no other fount I know I am washed I am washed I am drenched in love amen and how marvelous that the creator of this universe chooses to love you and send his son for you and how marvelous is it that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for you and for me. And how marvelous is it that we get to experience this this morning and with each other and those around the world. Whatever you're, you're coming from, wherever you're going to today, whatever burdens you may be carrying around or maybe the addictions that you might be trying to, to throw off or anger you have, whatever it is. How marvelous it is that, how marvelous it is that God says that he wants to take all of that from us. Give us rest, peace, life, joy. Remember this today, remember this this week, and how marvelous our Savior's love for us. I stand amazed in the 
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. Jesus in the streets, Jesus for my faith, every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Let's sing this out together, church. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. can be seated. Like Jake said, we don't know what you're coming in from. We don't know what you're going to. But uh, one thing I do feel confident being able to say to you is that there's a good chance we need a little bit of Jesus somewhere in our lives, right? Whether it's in our family, whether it's the way we're handling our future, the way we're dealing with uh, different circumstances that are going on around us. And that's our hope today. 
is to, man, just get a little bit more Jesus in you today than when you walked, than when you walked in. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and, and I want to welcome all of you to Hope Summit. And if you're watching us online, so glad that you could be with us here today. Before we get started um, in the sermon, I wanted to uh, let you guys be aware of something that's happening in a couple of weeks. Um, the last Sunday of the month, which I believe is June 30th, um, July. Yeah, it's July already, guys. Yeah, it sure is, isn't it? Yeah, July 30th, uh, we are going to be having a cake reception in the lobby for Nicole Bolin. Uh, Nicole Bolin uh, is, is our Connections Director, and uh, she's been working here for over 10 years, but many of you might not have known this. She's actually been involved at Hope Summit for 18 when she came here for Crossroads for college, she's been a part of Hope Summit that long. A uh, big part of her life has been here. And uh, she is uh, with her family going to Maine. Her husband has accepted a job in, uh, I said Maine, it's Maryland, sorry. And uh, I can't, yeah, good luck. I have to pre- you guys have to listen to me preach today. I feel bad for you. It's not me, yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, guys, Nicole, um, as many of you know, is just a beloved part of the staff here, beloved part of the church, and we want to send her off the right way. So would you please come, put that on your calendar so you can be here um, and uh, so you can say goodbye. But also, I want to encourage you to bring a gift to send them off with, right? Uh, They're moving. They're having to move across the country. And uh, as some of you know, that costs a little bit. So let's send her away uh, with some with some help and uh, just as a, a gratitude of, of so many, man, I'll tell you what, blood, sweat, and tears that that woman has poured into this place so that hope someone could be what it is today. So July 30th, would love to see you here for that. Um, I have a question as we get started here today. Um, what does it mean to be a part of your family? Uh, you know, each family kind of has uh, their own rhythms, their own way of life. There's, there's certain kind of ebbs and flows. There's rules. There's, there's spoken rules. There's unspoken rules. You know, to be a part of the family, we're all, you know, we all have little things that are different, probably things that are similar, but, you know, each family is a little bit different. So what does it mean to be a part of your family? And have you noticed that you don't actually have to be in the family to be a part of the family? Have you noticed that? Like, uh, I can think back over uh, my lifetime, and we have uh, many people that I love dearly that have become so close that they're more than just friends, that they're basically family. My kids have, um, uh, there's, there's friends of, of Miranda's and mine that my kids call aunts and uncles because they're so close and they mean so much to us, right? And so, uh, and, and the reason that they kind of get to claim that uh, being a part of the Madison family is because they know us so well and they've been a part of the family so much that there's kind of a like a dependency on one another the way that a family really works you know that they there's this like there's this teamwork that happens and they understand those ebbs and flows and what it means to be a part of the Madison family that they basically they you might as well just give them the last name you know right and and so uh, and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to experience that but it can be a really beautiful thing a really wonderful thing in fact there was a we were just celebrating uh, the birth of a, of a baby boy and that is not related to us at all. <laughs> but this young woman was, uh, when I first started in ministry, this, this, this girl was, I think, like 12, maybe 11. Uh, and she was going into sixth grade, and she was in my student ministry. And uh, then uh, she made a very special connection with my wife. It was around the house all the time. And then when we moved to Omaha, she was moving to school in Omaha. And so she was there. And then when she was in between schools, she lived in our basement. And the kids just, I, they've always had Amanda in their life. And, and uh, I did her, you know, my wife and I walked her through relationship stuff when she met her current husband. And then I got to do their wedding. And, and when we finally got to meet this little guy, it felt like, meeting a part of the family, you know? It can really be this really wonderful thing, and, 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 and being able to be accepted into a family that's not your own can be such a treasured thing, and today we're going to be talking about what it looks like to be a part of God's family, All right? Not just like, when we think God's family, like, you might be thinking, like, well, this church family, what's it be? Yeah, and, and that, that's a big part of this, but in general, what does it mean to be a part of our Father in Heaven's household. What does it mean to be a part of that? And, and yeah, there's like, there's different 
ebbs and flows and ways. Think, there's, there's things that we know are just good and those that aren't. But when we work together and we're a part of it, it really can be a beautiful thing to be accepted into his family. The question is, is do you know what it takes to be a part of of that family. I'm going to show you what I mean by get, digging into some stories here in the Bible. But before we do, we're going to pray. Because I'm hoping that by the end, and this is what I want you to open up your hearts to, that, that when you walk out of here, you're more fully aware and understanding what it means to be a part of God's family and hopefully confident that you can be a part of it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your uh, love and your grace. And Jesus, we do. We want to speak your name over everything that's going on in our lives, Lord, because it is through you, Jesus, that we are saved. And uh, it's it's by no other name. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and taking the penalty of our sins so that our Holy Father in heaven uh, is not repulsed by us, does not push us away because of our sin, but accepts us into his home. Thank you for that gift that you have given us, Lord. I pray that each person in this room and those who are listening or watching us online right now, Lord, that they are given a chance um, to know what it means to be in your family and that each one of us would continue to take steps to being a part of what you are doing and and, uh, to be a part of the family that you have uh, provided for us. Lord, we thank you um, for this chance to worship and to dive into your word. And I just ask that your spirit would speak, um, their spirit would move in the hearts of each person here and that the enemy's mouth would be shut and that my words would be yours, not mine. And that today uh, we would all walk out of here confident of what it means to be a part of your family, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be opening up to Galatians chapter 4. Um, we've been going through Galatians now for uh, quite a bit. We're just kind of taking it bit, bit by bit, piece by pit, piece. And so you can go ahead and get over to Galatians 4 in your Bibles or maybe use your phone for that. If you don't, that's fine. We're going to have it on the screens behind me or if you're watching online, it'll be in front of me. But uh, before we dive into this, uh, there's some important context. Uh, there's, there's, let's see, we're going to be reading from a guy named Paul who wrote Galatians, um, but he's going to reference a story that we need to understand. And as I was preparing for this message, um, it dawned on me that maybe not everyone is aware of the story. Even people who have been going to church for a while might uh, need a refresher on this story because it's not one, at least I hope some of it, that we talk about a lot. So, so we're, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what Galatians means, but first let's start with some family drama, right? Who doesn't love a little bit of family drama? Some of you love family drama so much that your family's drama is enough. You watch family drama on TV. I don't get that. I avoid those, avoid those family drama shows like because I got enough, man, right? I had enough growing up in it. So, guys, uh, we're, we're going to start off with some family drama uh, between a man named Abraham and his wife and his wife's servant named Hagar. Now, Abraham was a man who followed God, who believed in God, who trusted in God, and, and God saw Abraham's faithfulness. And he decided that he wanted to do something really big in our world, and, and, and he was going to do it through Abraham and Abraham's faithfulness. So he told Abraham, Abraham, because of your faithfulness to me, because you trust me, I, I'm going to make you into a great nation, right? Abraham, your children are going to have children who are going to have children who become this great nation. And through this nation, I am going to show myself to the world. You see, up to this point, God and the world had been really separated because of sin and because God is holy, and, and so he wanted to restore that. And so he began with the man named Abraham. Now, eventually Jesus would show up, but, but he started with Abraham, and he said, so I'm going to make you into a great nation, which sounds all and good, but the problem was that Abraham was really old, like really old, like that ship had sailed, folks. What it took for him to pass on any kind of genetic material, that was done. And not just that, his wife, right, had gone through all the things that women go through that the body, the body says, I'm done. I'm, child thing, I'm done with that, right? And so it was, a, it, was a, it was a big thing for Abraham to be able to trust this, right? But he trusted he did. I mean, Abraham was known to being a man of faith who was able to believe in the impossible, When everyone else looked at him and said, you're nuts, he said, I don't care if you think I'm nuts, I know what God says and I'm going to trust it, right? Now, the problem as well as Abraham being old was that God gave him this promise. He developed this covenant, this kind of, it's kind of like a contract, kind of like a, a, a marriage, this agreement between two parties. He gave, he developed this covenant with Abraham 
But then he didn't give his son, give him a son right away. He had to wait. It's not like the next day that Sarah took a pregnancy test, which I don't even know what that looked like back in the day, but it's like she got to find out, hey, we're pregnant, right? They had to wait. In fact, it took some years, which very much was a test of Abraham's faithfulness. Is God, is, is, FYI, a little side note, like some of you might really believe that God's going to do something in your life. The problem is we often want that now. We believe it now. God's wants you to give it to me now. But sometimes God has a plan, and sometimes a part of that plan is to wait to see if we will actually fully believe him even when it gets hard. Um, and hard it did become for Abraham and Sarah. To the point that Sarah devised a bit of a plan. As she looked to Abraham and said, Abraham, when's this promise going to happen? I'm not pregnant yet. Like, is this actually going to happen? What she did was she looked around her world and there was a cultural thing that was the norm where a man could have more than one spouse. And it was also a cultural norm that if a man had a child through his wife's servant, that child, he could take that child as his own. Right? So she looked at the culture of the day and said, hey, you know what? They're doing this. Let's do it. Maybe, and in fact, I can even see the justification. Maybe this is how God is planning on fulfilling his promise to us. Maybe God assumes that we are going to follow the culture and just do what everyone else is doing and we're going to be okay. So she tells Abraham, I want you to, to have my servant Hagar because she is young and can have children still that age, and I want you to have a child through her. And Abraham, being an old, wise man, said, yes, dear, right? So he had a child with Hagar, okay? Now, a firstborn son, especially in that culture, was a big deal because the firstborn son would have a special inheritance from the father. And until this point, Abraham had had no children, which means Hagar's son, Ishmael, was going to receive the inheritance Okay, he was going to be uh, he was going to be dependent upon his father until one day his father passed on and re- and gave everything that he had to his child, his children, especially his firstborn son. Hagar understood this and knew this, and she was fully aware of the fact that Abraham and Sarah were old, and she knew that her son would get everything Abraham had. Now Abraham was doing pretty well for himself, right? And she recognized that her son was going to get most of it and that she was going to live past Abraham and Sarah. And so things were looking pretty good for Hagar, right? And so she started to treat, Hagar started to look at Sarah and treat her with contempt. Hagar saw her son as kind of this ticket into an easier life and was kind of like, Sarah, I decide I don't really need you because now I'm the baby daddy, you know, like I got this, I'm, I'm set, Sarah got unhappy with how she was being treated by her servant. And she came to Abraham and said, what have you done to me? And I can just imagine Abraham going, but you, I, you told me, I, ah, right? You can imagine that moment when Sarah comes storming in saying, you did this to me. And he's like, you told me to do it, right? So Abraham says something that I can almost hear the frustration in his voice. You can go look at this story in Genesis. You can just hear, he's like, she's your servant do with her as you please. Well, well, okay, fine. She's your servant. Do with you what, what you will. So Sarah sends Hagar and Ishmael away. Kicks them out. You're no longer my servant. You're not a part of the family. Go. Your son is now your own problem. Now, just a little, another little side note. If you ever feel like you're not worthy of God's love, and maybe you've done some things that you're not proud of, and it seems like you've made some poor choices, all you have to do is read the stories of some of the people in the Bible that, that we talk about a lot, and you're going to find there's a bunch of scumbags there. But God is still good, and he's, and he's faithful, and he's gracious. And so if Sarah can have a chance, you can too, okay? So just no one gets to walk out of here being like, I'm too bad for God's goodness. All you have to look at, kind of, Sarah was a bit of a scumbag. But, 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 she... She also was a part of the family of God, okay? And God is faithful even when we're not. And, and, and so what I, the reason I tell you this and the reason that Paul is going to talk about it, there's a very important thing we're going to understand here, is that they had received a promise from God, but they decided to make that promise come alive themselves by their own 
choices, their own volition, by their own will. Okay, They made a choice so that they could get what they thought God was going to give them. And because they were the ones to try to fulfill the promise to themselves, there was strife, there was division, there was ugliness, and almost death. Ishmael almost dies okay, as a result of this. Now, God is faithful. God takes care of Hagar and Ishmael. Right? There's a beautiful uh, moment between Hagar and God where she gives him a name called the one who sees me. I have a tattooed on my arm because it's a really beautiful story of God's provision. Okay? But the point is when Sarah and Abraham tried to do things on their own and to provide for themselves, it led to destruction. Now, eventually God was faithful. Abraham was around 100 years old. Sarah wasn't much further along, and she became pregnant. And the promised child, the child of promise, Isaac, was born. And when he was born, the results were very different. There was joy. There was joy. There was celebration. There was laughter. Okay? Sarah says, man, people are going to hear about this, and they're just going to laugh out loud. They're going to lull because, goodness gracious, this is insane, that a woman of my age would have a child. So you see the difference. When, when, when Sarah and Abraham tried to make the promise work for themselves by their own power, by their own strength, by their own planning, it led to destruction. But when they waited on the promise, when they trusted in the promise and waited on God's provision of the promise, things were filled with joy. Okay? So there's the first bit of context. Second bit of context is really about Galatians. For our friends who, uh, maybe this is your first time here, or maybe you haven't been coming very long. Galatians, we've been in here for a little while, and the purpose of what's happening uh, in this whole letter is really important for us to understand what we're about to read. Galatians was written by a guy named Paul, who was a church planner. So he would go into, place, into the regions of Galatia, and he was preaching the message of Jesus. And the message of Jesus is a message of promise. The message of promise that it is because of God's goodness that we are saved. Now, you and I were separated from God because of our sin. And we were unable to, to, to say no to sin. We were powerless against it. Not only powerless against sin, but the results of sin, which is death. Okay, Because of sin, there's death. And we were powerless against it. There was nothing we could do. There was no good that we could do to earn God's love. There was no good that we could do to make up for the sin. Like it was, it was, we were broken in our sin and we were slaves to it. So what God did was he came and he sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. If you're watching online, there's a cross right there. That's why I keep pointing over there. Uh, the, he came and he died on the cross paying for our mistakes, paying for our sin, because our sin, death was our result. But Jesus took that death upon himself. And then Paul was preaching the message that if you choose to believe this, which is hard, about as hard as believing that a 100-year-old man is going to have a child, about as hard as believing that an 80-year-old woman is going to have a baby, it's hard to believe that Jesus was a real man who came 2,000 years ago, died on a cross, and then rose again three days later, and then ascended into heaven, and is now sitting at the right hand of God, and we're all waiting for him to come back. That's hard to believe. In fact, you go out in the world today, and they're going to tell you you're nuts for believing this. But when we choose to trust in this, when we choose to believe that there is a God, and that he does have a problem with my sin, and there's nothing that I can do about it, but what I can do is trust that Jesus died for me, and if I put my trust in that, I'm okay. When you choose to believe that, even though it's hard, God sees that, and what he does is he exchanges your sin for Jesus' goodness. Okay, in, in uh, Corinthians it says that Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. So we could be right before God, so that by faith... And because God is faithful in his promises, you and I are now restored to the family. You and I are now given forgiveness of sins. You and I are now given this gift of eternal life that is found in Jesus Christ. Paul came and he preached about being children of promise. About being a part of this family of God. Because of faith in Jesus Christ, faith of the promise of God's goodness, not our ability to be good. And what was happening 
was after he planted these churches, he left to continue to plant more churches. And Jews were coming into the churches in Galatia. Jews were coming in and telling them, hang on, hang on. If you really want to know God, it's not through faith in Jesus. If you really want to please God, if you really want a relationship with God, if you really want to be a part of the family of God, you need to join the the covenant that God started through Abraham. You need to be a part of Abraham's family. And the way you do that is by being circumcised and by following these laws and observing these special days and fasting in this way and giving this much amount to the temple and this much amount to these people and doing all these things. And by doing those things, you're going to please God and you can be a part of the family of God. Now, Paul heard about these Jews coming into his churches and he was rather upset because they were unraveling all the work that he had done. These Jews were coming in and telling them that you had to follow these laws to be acceptable to God when he had been preaching. No, the only way we're acceptable to God is by trusting in Jesus' goodness and by trusting in, in Jesus being good enough for the Father. And that by putting our faith in his goodness and his ability to forgive us even though we don't deserve it, that's the only way that we can have this relationship with God. So we had two opposing messages, and Paul writes the letter of Galatians to fight back against what the Jews are telling them. Now, I caught you up, we can read. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law... Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one another by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman, Sarah, was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai, which is where Moses had the... The, the, the tablets, right? The, the stone tablets. This is where the, the, the Mosaic covenant comes into play. One covenant is from the Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, the reason that Paul uses such strong language, we've been talking about this, is because the law, okay, the, the, what the Jews were telling these Galatians to follow, Paul was saying, if you follow the law, you're, you're a slave to God. You're not, you're not a part of the family. Because the law only requires your obedience, guys. The law doesn't require anything else but you to say yes to what God wants and no to what God doesn't want. So if we try to follow the law, if we try to follow a bunch of rules so that we can please God, we're basically just a slave to the law. That's his point. Verse 25, now Hagar stands on Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Paul's looking to Jerusalem, which is like the heart of the Jewish faith. He's looking to Judea and he's saying this is a city, this is a country that is basically built on slavery to the law. Okay, and that's Hagar's family. This is the the, the people born to a slave woman, right? But, But the Jerusalem that is above, meaning Christ, Meaning heaven, the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, that you never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud when you've never heard, uh, when you were never in labor, because mothers, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who is who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, so now he was talking to the Jews, and now he turns back to the Galatians. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of a promise. Not of a bunch of laws, not of a bunch of rules, not by your ability to get things right and to make things happen for yourself so that you can be acceptable to God. No, you are children of a promise that is given through the faithfulness of God through Christ, not your faithfulness. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit is the same now. He's just drawing some parallels. That's another part of the story. Ishmael and Isaac don't get along. And right now, uh, when Paul's writing these words, the Jews are persecuting the Christians. But listen, verse 30 says, but what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. 
So Paul is drawing these parallels to something that happened back in Abraham's time. It happened throughout the history of Judea. It was happening in the early church, and it's happening today. That figuratively speaking, there are two moms, and you are born to one or the other, and you can choose whether you want to be a part of the slave mom or the free mom. And the way that you begin, and, 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 and how you want to end, you, how you think you're going to enter into a, the family of God, you're going to either try to get in through the slave woman's, or you're going to enter in through the free woman. You're going to be a part of that old way of thinking, the, the temporary law. You're going to be a part of, even today, guys, even today, you're going to try to earn your favor with God. But truly, if you try to do that, you honestly are just a slave to whatever law you're trying to follow. Or we can choose to enter into the family of God through freedom, through promise. Okay, I I asked, uh, or I I brought up a, a question that I wanted to answer today. What does it mean to be a part of the family of God? What does that look like? And, and I have a real question for you. Are you a part of it? And how do you know? That's why I want you to be confident in that question. Am I a part of the family of God? And so to, to begin, I would, I would challenge you. We're going we're gonna to talk about a couple of things today, and then we're going to continue this into next week. But how you get into the family matters. It matters to God. How you, so, so if I ask you, how do you get into the family of God? How you answer that question matters to him because it tells, you, it tells us, it tells him and it tells anyone who's listening a lot about what it is you really believe about God, about yourself, and really who's in charge. Because if, if you and I say, well, and, and, and there are people, I've met people like this in the church, outside of the church, I've met many people who are like, well, I know that, I, that I'm a part of the family of God because I go to church enough, because I give to the poor, because whatever it is you want to say, because uh, my family's Catholic, okay? I'm a part of the family of God because I grew up doing this, or I'm a part of the family of God because I pray enough, or I'm a part of the family of God because I know enough about Scripture, or I'm a part of the family of God because of blank, whatever, however it is that you might fill in that blank. And I just want to tell you, friend, if when I ask you, how do you know you're a part of the family of God, if, if you start giving a list of these things that you've done or these things that you've said no to or avoided, friend, in truth, you're really in slavery. You're really in slavery. Because, because if it's about our obedience, then God's only interested in having servants in his home. But he's not. You see, what God wants is he wants to bring home his kids. What God wants is he wants his children to come home. You see, in the beginning, when he created all things, he created all things just right, just the way he wanted to. And he brought children into this world. And he said, children, this is what it means to be a part of my family. And those children said, nah, we want to do things our way. And I don't know about you, but I've been that child. I've been that child. Well, I was that child. (laughs) God bless my mother and my father for having to put up with me, right? I was that kid. But even today, man, there's things that I want to hold on to, things I want to do my way. Like, that's the thing. Like, and, and, and as a result of that, guys, there was this separation. Okay? And, and, and God, being a loving God, a loving father, didn't want to, he wanted to have his kids home. He didn't want his kids out to be out in the world, to just be off on their own, to be kind of, I mean, I mean, guys, you know the world we live in. This is not an easy place to be. It's not necessarily a safe place to be, okay? This is a difficult world that we live in, and God doesn't want us to just be out there alone. He wants to bring us home, and that's what he started in Abraham. That's what he continued to do in Jesus, and that's the invitation that he offers today. The problem is that there's still this thinking that if I want to please God, I have to do this, 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 and this, and I need to not do this, 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 and this. And that, become, that can become our focus. I know so many people who are not interested in being here on a Sunday 
They've told me, Jeff, if I went to church, I'd go to your church because I like you, but I don't want to go to church because church is all about rules. Unfortunately, the message about being a part of God's family has somehow become all about the rules when it's something so much better, so much deeper. What it really comes down to is, well, is dependence. I mean, think about what it means to be a child, right? And, and, and man, my understanding of who God was changed so much when I understood what it means to be a dad, okay? I have three kids. They're all teenagers, so I've had the baby, toddler, grade school uh, stages. Like, those are all done, right? And, and now we're kind of preparing them to fly off. My daughter just turned 18, technically adult, right? She says, Dad, can I do this? I'm like, well, you're 18, so that's kind of up to you now, right? Like, you can choose. But uh, what really defines my relationship with my kids, that's well, two things. One of them we're going to talk about now, but uh, the next one we're going to talk about next week is, is dependency and what it means to be a part of the family. And that, again, like I talked about, that ebb and that flow and like there's... There's some things that you know you just do and you know you just don't do. Some things that have been very clear, don't do this, please do this. And why we follow that, which again, we'll talk about next week, right? That obedience is a part of this. Remembering that obedience does not earn you a place in the family, okay? I had friends, (laughs) I had a friend named Matt who was better at following my house rules than I was, okay? But that didn't make him a son, did it? You see, it is something different. It's, and, it, and it really centralizes around this idea of dependency. So when I ask you, are you a part of the family of God? The first question that needs to be answered is, how do you get there? Well, the answer to how to get to be a part of the family of God is through faith in Jesus, right? But what does it mean to, like, be a child of God? I want to ask you, are you dependent upon God? Because to be in his family, to be his child... To be a child of God means to be dependent. Are you dependent upon God? Is that reflected in the way that you live your life? That's hard. It's a hard question to answer. It's a a hard uh, concept to get, especially for adults. Because I know that for many of you, at the end of the day, you're probably thinking, well, Jeff, God doesn't give me a paycheck, so I have to go out there and get it, right? Right? So what does it look like to live dependent upon God? In fact, I know some people who have very strong feelings about this. They say, Jeff, God, God takes their care of those who take care of themselves, right? That's where that saying came from. He's like, uh, if I want something from God, I have to go get it, right? And ultimately, what that saying is saying that, like, I'm ultimately dependent upon myself, Right? God's given me a couple of things, but ultimately it's up to me. And so I, especially if you are out there and you're, maybe you're listening to this, catching up with us later online, or maybe you're here today and you're thinking like, yeah, Jeff, I mean, I carry the responsibility of my own life on my shoulders, which in some way seems very true. But if you are a child of God living dependently on him, it can actually manifests itself in many different ways in the way that you're living. Okay, first and foremost, if you're the person that's like, God doesn't give me anything, I have to go get it myself. Can I just remind you of something? What did you do to earn your hands? What did you do to earn those? How about your lungs that breathe and keep you alive? Even your talents. Now, some of you have worked hard to hone those talents, but I know a lot of my talents come from something that's very natural inside of me. That's why I love drums. I've always had rhythm. It's just a part of me. So it was very natural for me to pick up those sticks and figure out how to do that. Yeah, there was some practice, but it was very much a God-given talent in a lot of ways that I didn't earn. It was given to me. So when you think about your work and your livelihood, like, Being dependent upon God and our livelihood is very much being aware that even my ability to go earn a job is dependent upon what God has given to me. And to be grateful for that and to keep that in mind. For some of you, this could change your life. Because some of you are in a dead-end job doing something that you're not gifted to do because you're worried about a paycheck. 
And if you started looking to who God made you to be, you might be able to find something that actually makes, that gives you joy while you do it. That's living dependent upon God. Do you see that? But a big way, and this is the one we're going to really uh, kind of end with here, is how about your future, guys? Who ultimately is responsible for your future? Right? Now, this is a tough one. But if you and I want to live as a child dependent upon God, we need to be able to figure out who ultimately is in charge of our future. Now, once again, you've been given a brain, and you've been given the ability to look ahead and make some guesses, some educated guesses about what your future might be like. And so, you know, if you decide to save for retirement, good on you. God's up in heaven going like, glad you're smart enough to think about that. All right, I gave you a brain, use it, right? That's, you're going to one day need support when you're old, right? And I, I don't know if my kids are going to become billionaires. That'd be awesome, but I just don't see that happening, right? So I have to prepare for my future, okay? But even as I say that, there might be someone saying, so Jeff, what you're saying is ultimately I'm dependent upon myself for my future, and I know that some of you have actually been crushed by that thought. You, do you carry the weight of the future on your shoulders, adult? If you have children, do you carry the weight of their future on your shoulders? Can I remind you of something that Jesus said? He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Look at the birds. They don't sit around. You don't see the birds fluttering around going like, oh, man, I hope I have enough for tomorrow. You don't see the fields going like, oh, I hope I have enough flowers to cover me and make me beautiful. You don't see that happening, do you? He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Why does God tell us that? Because what he's looking for are children who are dependent upon him, who are going to trust him, who are going to have faith, who are going to believe in his promises to be children of a promise, to be children of freedom that is found in the security of knowing that God is the one who has my future. You know what God has given you? God has given you right now. You know what God has not given you? God has not given you what he has, which is the ability to be above time. So you think about that. God created us to be creatures in time. I mean, if he wanted to, he could have created us as fourth dimensional creatures. If he really wanted to, he could have done that, but he didn't, did he? Why? Because he's not looking for you to be able to provide for yourself. He wants to be your dad. He wants to be in charge. He wants to take care of you. He wants you to be in his family. So he is giving you right now, not tomorrow. He's giving you right now. And so you can trust him and be dependent on him now. Now, we are going to, again, we're going to talk about what it means because, again, to be a part of the family, if you're going to come into the Madison home, there's some rules you're going to have to live by, okay? We just have rules. Now, those rules are in place for a reason. There's good reasons why they're there, but we're going to talk about what it means to be a child of God in obedience next week, and, in fact, it's going to bleed into the, even the week after. we got a lot to talk about coming up here, right? But today, what I want for you is to be confident about what it means to be a part of the family of God. It is founded first and foremost in Jesus Christ. It is through his promise of his faithfulness and his goodness that you are given a chance to be a part of the family of God. And then to live as a child of God is to recognize our dependency, our need upon it, and continue to live in faith day by day, trusting in his promises and trusting that he's going to take care of his kids. Right Now, the best example of this, and we're going to be moving into uh, our communion time, where we're going to take communion. best example of this is actually a story that Jesus set, tells us in Luke 11. Luke 11:42. 11, Jesus continued, "There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, "Father, give me my share of the estate." So he divided his property up between his boys. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. You see, what this younger son wanted was the younger son wanted independence. 
He didn't want to be under the Father anymore. He wanted to make his choices. He wanted to have his stuff, and he wanted to live the way that he wanted to live. But after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs that the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer be worry, worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, ignoring him, said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him, and get a ring and put it on his finger, and put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The thing I want you to recognize here is that the father is not interested in having more servants. The father is not interested in having more servants. The son offered himself as a servant. But the father ignored him because the father is interested in having his son back home. If God wanted you to follow a bunch of rules so that you could please him, all that would make you is a servant, a slave in his home. And he's not interested in having slaves in his home. He's interested in having free sons and daughters. And he provided a way through his son Jesus. While you and I were slaves to our sin, slaves to our flesh, which we're going to talk a lot more about in the next couple of weeks, when we were trying to fix ourselves with a bunch of rules and slaves either to our flesh or slaves to a bunch of rules, God sent his son, a free son, to make a free choice. And, he, and that son used his free choice to die, to take this problem of sin that was on the rest of us upon his own shoulders. And he died. But he rose again three days later. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And now he's up in heaven and God is looking to each one of us saying, if you want to come home, just trust that I'm good. Just trust that I love you enough that I sent my son to pay for your sin. Just trust me enough that, yeah, you've made some mistakes, but I love you anyway. Christian, if you have stumbled and stumbled and stumbled and stumbled again since you started believing, and you're starting to wonder if you're about to use up whatever patience the Father has for you, I want you to remember that God is not interested in having a servant. He's interested in having a son. And yeah, a good son knows what it's like to follow the rules, and a good daughter knows what it's like to follow the rules in the household. And honestly, those rules are a lot better for you than they are against trying to stop you from having fun. It's really good for you. And when you learn to trust that, and when you learn to be dependent upon God, not independent upon God, when you choose to realize that his way is better than your way, when you choose to recognize that there's no sacrifice that you can give that's going to appease God of your sins, that that sacrifice was already given through his son, Jesus Christ, then you, my friend, are now adopted in as a son and a daughter, and nothing can change that. So stop trying to earn his favor. Be free. Be free and just trust that he's good. Trust that he has your future. Trust that everything you have now, yeah, it's because of his goodness. Trust that everything that maybe isn't going right in your life right now, he wants to be a part of the solution. He wants to be a part of helping you out of that. Or he's just waiting because in his time, he's going to do something great. Just trust him that he's got you. I just want you to rest in that, just knowing you can be a part of the family. And so much of it is not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon God's faithfulness. And if you can trust that, welcome to the family. We're going to take communion. Trays are going to be passed. There's two cups stacked on top of one another. Inside one of them is some bread, and inside the other is juice. Take out two of those stacked cups, pass it on to your neighbor, and when you're ready, take communion. 
And when you take communion, remember that the reason that we can have a relationship with God is because of Jesus and his goodness, because of his faithfulness to freely give his, himself, freely give his body to die, freely give his blood to be spilled. And just remember that. Just sit in that goodness of his faithfulness and his love and his forgiveness for you. And then just be a part of the family, okay? You're not going to get it perfect, but none of us do. It's just because our dad's so good, right, that any of this is really any good. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your provision to us of salvation through your body and through your blood. Thank you for taking the problem of sin and for giving us a gift of faith. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to believe, help us all to trust. I pray that if there's anyone out there trying to earn your love, earn your grace, trying to give enough so that you'll let go of their sin, I pray that you would speak to them now and that you would assure them that their sin has already been paid for. They just need a trust in Jesus to call out to his name. Jesus, we rest in your goodness and we thank you for creating a pathway to our Father so that we go back home, so we could be taken care of. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Walk right through it My fears 
sing this with me. Cause I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am as I am. Child of God, sing I am one more time. As I am a child of God, let that take you into this week, and let that affect uh, how you treat how you treat others, and how you see yourself. That you are a child of God. That your neighbors and friends and coworkers are children of God as well. We have a. Uh, we just want you to have a great week, and know that uh, God loves you and sees you. I'm on your way out. We have these baskets in the front and the back. For those of you that, that call Hope Summit home that want to give, you can give through there. You can give online uh, through our Kindred app. Um, and it's very easy and convenient to set it and just kind of forget it. Um, we also have the one-for-one -one boxes here in the front and in the back. Right now we have someone who has uh, had a house fire that has some really bad burns that need surgery. And we just get to drop a dollar in. Um, and this is our last week, and we get to give them a check and um, just to say, we see you, we love you. I'm sorry that happened to you, but here's a little bit to help cover your costs. And um, there's no expectation for them. We just say, we love you, we see you, Jesus sees you. Um, and it's just an awesome opportunity for us to just love on someone. If you have someone you want to nominate, you can nominate them at hopesummitchurch.com as well. And the staff sees that, and we go over that. As, um, I hope you guys have a great week. In Christ alone. My hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the of the world by darkness lay then bursting forth in glory